Well, good morning, and it's me, Kenny Polcari, and today is Monday, March 18th, 2024, and I, as usual, am your host of the party. And so, what is happening today? What's happening this week? Oh, so much going on. And as you know, I am actually on my way off to Bali, Singapore on the Steve Forbes Investment Cruise tomorrow, so it'll be sporadic over the next two weeks, but I will be back on uh, Monday, April 1st, right? So here are the things you need to know. The macro data continues to cause confusion for the Fed and then, by default, investors. Fed futures are now pricing in a July rate cut. The big banks are all revising their rate cut forecasts. Of course they are. And some economists continue to suggest we could actually see rate hikes versus a cut. Oil's up, more unrest across the Middle East. Gold is down on top of the rate cut or no cut narrative, right? What are we having dinner tonight? We're going to have the Atlantic cod in a coconut milk dill sauce. Simple to make and so delicious to eat. Now, like I said to you last week, I just want to reiterate the fact that I'm going to be gone from tomorrow through the 31st of March. I'm going to be on that Steve Forbes investment cruise from Bali to Singapore. I will be working. I will be working. So while I'm, I may make an occasional post, it won't be the daily post, right? But I'm going to be back on Monday, April 1st. So until then, uh, take good care. So stocks fell for the day. And for the week last week, after trying to digest and dissect the latest hotter than expected inflation data on Friday. Again, after a long, confusing week, we saw the Dow lose 190 points. Uh, the the S&P gave back 34 points. The Nasdaq lost 155 points. The Russell added 8 points. While well, transports gave up 110, while the equal weight S&P lost 11 points. All this on Friday. I say confusing because investors had to consider what's next for the markets across multiple fronts, right? Some of the macroeconomic news is suggesting that the U.S. economy is slowing down, and some of it's suggesting otherwise, right? All while inflation is showing a year-over-year -year basis is declining, but is suddenly start to rise on a month-over-month -month basis, and that is keeping the inflation story alive and well, causing all kinds of speculation about what's next for the Fed. And that's causing angst amongst some of the players, right? Think the long-term investors, asset managers, traders, and algos. And everyone tries to handicap when a rate cut is coming, if at all, right? Think long-term investors, asset managers, traders, and algos have to kind of consider what that move potentially may mean or not mean, right? Now, the futures markets are now pricing in the first rate cut in July, this versus what they had been expecting in June, which moved from May. <laughs> Looks like there's a pattern to me. Six months ago, it was a March cut, which got moved to a May cut. Then it got moved to a June cut. And now it's being moved to a July cut, which I find interesting because beyond May, it puts us within that six-month election window. And we all know that the Fed is not supposed to move on rates in either direction during that period. Now, there are some big investment banks that are scrambling to change their forecast suddenly, right? JP Morgan, for example, was calling for 125 basis points or 525 basis point cuts in 2024. Now they're calling for 75, which is only three 25 basis point cuts this year, which still makes zero sense to me, right? Because I just don't see it. Now, I'm in the no cut camp. But there are some on the street that suggest we could actually see rates go up this year. And they're really coming from the economist, right, rather than go down. This week is sure to shed more light on this very argument as the Fed is due to release their latest dot plot graph on Wednesday when they, res when they report their FOMC results. And that the, the dot plot is what details what they are thinking behind the Iron Curtain. And on a side note, speaking of the Iron Curtain... Vlad was re-elected by an overwhelming majority, right? Something like 87% this week, uh, over the weekend. I mean, can you believe that? The Russian media is calling it a landslide, while the Western media is calling it illegitimate. <laughs> Vlad says it's a validation of his leadership. <laughs> okay, whatever. You can run with that. It was also a triple witching on Friday, right? A quarterly event that sees options on stocks, indexes, and futures all expire on the same day, causing all kinds of volume. But really nothing more, right? The $5.3 trillion worth of options expiry uh, forced traders to roll existing positions or create new ones, uh, which causes all kinds of activity. But it says absolutely nothing about the future path of markets, 
reiterating the fact that long-term investors should not be reacting to all that noise, right? Now, the quantum trades continue to do well. The PSQ, SH, and DOG all uh, ended the day up by about four-tenths of a percent on Friday as pressure on stocks remained the plot of the week. The VIX, which is the fear index, which surged by 11% on Friday, was up another 8% by 1.30 on, on uh, Friday, confirming the lows of the day because the VIX was up, stocks were down, right? But uh, it did end up the day uh, as traded, it ended up the day only uh, off by about 2% as traded types went on an afternoon shopping spree looking for bargain. The VIXI ETF, which gets you long the fear, also rose by 5% by 130, but ended the day up by about just 2%. Four of the, five, uh, four of the 11 S&P sectors, industries, utilities, energy, and basic materials, ended the day in the green, while the others all saw losses. Tech, including most subsectors as well, Consumer discretionary communications all coming under the most pressure, all losing more than 1%, while financials, consumer staples, healthcare, and real estate ended the day just slightly lower. And that tells me that investors are rearranging their portfolios, moving money out of the outperformers uh, into some of the underperformers, but not completely into cash, right? So that suggests they still want exposure. Bonds continued to waffle, and while they did end a bit lower, there was nothing really dramatic. They were off by about a tenth of a percent for the day. Now, year-to-date, the TLT is down 6%, the TLH is down 4.75. The AGG, the Bloomberg Aggregate Bond Index, which includes treasuries and corporates, corporates being the saving grace here, is down 2% year-to-date. Yields on the two-year jumped by three basis points. Uh, to end the day yielding 4.7%, while the 10 yield was up one basis point to end the day yielding 4.3. Oil, which pierced $80 last week, is trading up 70 cents this morning at 81.75. This is geopolitical risks are once again on the rise. Last week, Ukraine launched a number of drone strikes on Russian refineries, sparking a fire at one of those refineries that produces about uh, 170,000 barrels per day or 7% of their capacity. And in Israel, Bibi confirmed that he's, he is going to push into Rafa, defying the U.S. and other allies. Causing This is causing Senator Chuck Schumer, the highest ranking Jewish member of Congress, to call for an end to Bibi's reign. And this forced Bibi to tell Chucky to go to hell. In the end, though, it is feared that this push is going to make regional peace even more difficult. And all that means is that tensions are going to remain elevated, and that's going to put a floor under oil. And we haven't even heard anything from the Hooties, right? Just wait till they start again. I think oil remains in the $80 to $85 trading range with a bias to the upside. And those higher prices have yet to be reflected in the U.S. macro data. Gold, which got punched in the head last week, down 30 points or so on Thursday and Friday, is down another $2 this morning at $21.59 an ounce. Stuart Varney and I discussed this very fact on Friday morning on Varney & Co., right? You can find my interview posted on my Twitter. You can find the link on my written blog. So if you go there, you can click on the link to see how we discuss that. Now, since I don't think rates are going lower, I expect gold to retreat a bit. I'm thinking the 21, 21, 50 range overnight, this, uh, overnight last night, gold tested 2149, which is lower, a lower low than it was last week. Remember though, gold is the ultimate safety trade, right? For some investors, it protects against the recession and it helps ease the angst created by global political unrest. Futures are confused this morning. Dow futures are down 16, but the SQs are up 16. The Nasdaq's up 125, the Russell's flat. Apple is quoted up a dollar at 173.50, uh, and Google is up 3% at 147.50 after a report revealed that Apple is in talks for Google to provide its AI engine into the Apple iPhone. SMCI, a name we discussed in late January, is up 270% year to date, is up more than 1,000% over 12 months, is due to be included in the S&P as of today. Now, this was already known. Today is just the official date of execution. And all this does is create more institutional interest in the name as so many asset managers will now have to include this company into their models that mimic the S&P index, which is another reason why we've seen that stock move up already as these asset managers have been buying up the stock so they can balance out their portfolios. Now, this is a big week for eco data and central bank data. My God says that both are equally important, but... The focus is going to be on the Fed, the Bank of England, the ECB, and what the BOJ, the Bank of Japan, all have to say. Here at home, we're going to get data on building permits, housing starts, mortgage apps, manufacturing and services, PMIs, existing and new home sales at the end of the week. 
European stocks this morning are up, nothing more than a bounce, right? They're up small. Uh, markets across the region up about two tenths, nothing dramatic. Look for, uh, ma we're looking for macro data uh, on the European zone. We're looking for Europe, uh, European zone CPI. We're looking for UK CPI. We're also going to get central bank policy decisions from Switzerland, Norway, Brazil, Canada, Taiwan, Indonesia, and Mexico. The S&P closed at 51.17 on Friday, down 34 points. And while futures are suggesting a small bounce this morning, I'm still not buying it. I remain cautious going into the end of the quarter. I'm keeping new money just in the money market funds, which are paying 5%, just until I see what the fallout is that I'm expecting, right? I'm still invested in stocks, so if it doesn't work out and stocks go high, guess what? I'm going along and so is my money. In the end, I do not believe that Wednesday's FOMC meeting is really gonna change the narrative, which is and has been, we are waiting for more definitive evidence of a slowdown. I remain in the no-cut camp because I don't see the evidence of a slowdown, and nor do I think that the Fed should be cutting rates to stimulate demand, right? I don't think they should be raising them either. I think they should be fine right where they are, right? And the market action uh, tends to agree, right? Remember, five and a quarter percent rates is historically normal. It's not high by any stretch of the imagination. As a long-term investor, you know what the deal is. You have to remain focused. Stick to the plan. Talk to your advisor, or better yet, call me to discuss. I'm always happy to help you create a long-term wealth plan that's gonna provide for you, and then potentially generations to come. Okay, so now what are we having for dinner tonight? This is a great recipe. Uh, saw it uh, a couple of weeks ago, and so decided to try it, and here it is. It's Atlantic cod in a coconut dill kind of poaching sauce, uh, coconut milk and dill kind of poaching sauce. It's really delicious. It's simple to make. Uh, for this, you need the cod fillets. You need salt and pepper. You need lemon slices, right? You're going to slice the lemon. You need coconut milk. You need dill and you need garlic, right? You're going to start by seasoning the fillet. Season, dry the fillets, right? Pat them dry with paper towel and then season them with salt and pepper on both sides and set them aside for a minute. Now, in a large saute pan, that's going to be enough to, to, uh, to uh, take all the fillets. You're going to heat up some olive oil, throw in the sliced garlic, saute it around for a little bit, then add the lemon slices to the pan first, place, uh, and then place the cod fillets on top of the lemon slices. Now add the coconut milk so it almost covers the fish, and then top that with the chopped dill. Keep the heat on medium-low. You want to really poach the fish using a spoon to continually take the juice, the, the coconut milk, and put it over the fish just as it cooks, right? You're going to serve this over wild rice. Make sure you top it with some of the extra sauce. Enjoy this with a, your favorite green veggie, maybe a, a steamed French-cut green bean or steamed asparagus, right? And a glass of chilled pino grillo santa margarita always works fine with this dish. In any event, look, it was a beautiful weekend here in South Florida. It's going to be a beautiful day today. And like I said, I am off. So this is the last post, uh, I think, for today because I'm going to be traveling for the next three days by the time I get there. Uh, but we'll see. I'll make an occasional post, uh, and I'll report all about it when I get back. I'm looking forward to it. It is sure to be a spectacular uh, cruise from Indonesia, Bali, Indonesia to Singapore. In any event, until I see you next, take good care.